Welcome to Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School. If you ask me my favorite action movie, I probably would pull out Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm talking about a movie where you just sit on the edge of your seat the whole time because it's one action after another one. Never mind that it's built on kind of a faulty premise. Uh, the idea that the Ark is findable and, and uh, it ends on a faulty premise. The idea that the Ark is stored in some warehouse in Washington, D.C. right now. But it focuses on that Ark of the Covenant. That Ark of the Covenant and, and to capture some of the mystique of that Ark of the Covenant that was there during the Old Testament times prior to it being lost, probably to Nebuchadnezzar. The Ark of the Covenant carries with it, uh, represents the presence of God among his people. And so when you come to Je uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, and, Israelite, and the Israelites are going to war with the Philistines, and in chapter 4, verse 4, Four, so the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of e Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were with the Ark of the Covenant of God. They're in battle, and they think the battle might go better if God's in the middle of this battle. So they take the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh, from its place in the worship shrine, and bring it out on the battlefield. It gets captured. It gets captured by the Philistines. That thing that symbolized the presence of God, elsewhere called his footstool or his seat, is now in the hands of the Philistines. The news comes back to Shiloh, to Eli. And when Eli, and, and by the way, Eli's sons die in that battle also. When Eli hears that his sons die, he's shocked. When he hears that the Ark of the Covenant's been captured, he is so upset, he falls over backwards, breaks his neck, and dies himself. I think there's a little humor in the next section. Not humor in Eli's death and, Eli and the capture of the ark, but humor in what happens with his ark, the travels of the ark. Chapter 5, verse 1. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they carried it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Dagon is one of the primary gods of the Philistines, and he's a fish god with hands and feet, if you can imagine that. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of Yahweh. Is this great or what? The Philistine god falls over in the presence of the ark of the covenant. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. See, I think there's humor there. When you have to take your own God and stand him back up because he fell over, uh, it kind of tells you a little bit about the capabilities of the God you worship. But when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of Yahweh, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off upon the threshold. He can't think and he can't do anything. He's in the presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Well, they got other problems besides the fact that their God won't stand up in the, presence of, in the presence of Yahweh. The other problem is that the people of Ashdod get afflicted with tumors. And some, uh, there's some scholars that think that ought to be translated hemorrhoids. Either way, not a pleasant situation. So they say, you know, we think this ark is not really a good thing to have in your community. So they send it to a neighboring Philistine community. They send it over to Gath. And everybody in Gath gets tumors or hemorrhoids. So, so they send it to Ekron. And everybody in Ekron gets tumors or hemorrhoids. And finally they decide this really isn't working out. This may not be a piece of furniture we want to pass around throughout our cities. So instead of going to all five cities, they quit after three. And they decide to send it home. They put an offering inside. They put five golden tumors, or hemorrhoids, I don't know what those look like, and I don't know if I want to, 
and five golden mice. Some people think that what they got is the plague because the mice would represent uh, the, the, the transmittal of the, of the plague, plague being transmitted by, uh, by fleas and so forth. So they send these five tumors and five mice in the ark and get rid of it. How do you get rid of a thing like this? Well, they had a unique way of doing it. We're told in verse 10, the men did so, took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. Now, I'm not a farmer. My grandfather was a cattleman. I'm smart enough to know that if you take two milk cows and shut up their calves, those milk cows are going to head straight back for those calves. These didn't. They put the ark of Yahweh, verse 11 of chapter 6, on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway. Those cows went straight back to Israel. If you lock up a cow's calves, those cows should go right back to those calves. They didn't. They went straight to Israel with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, who's driving that wagon? God's driving that wagon. When it gets back over to Beth Shemesh, some of the Israelites decide, you know, it'd be really cool to take a look at what's in this thing. And when they do, God slews, kills them because his law is that only the priests should touch that ark. And they don't even really touch it. They put a hole through the, uh, pole through the rings and carry it that way. God's presence does some astounding things. One of the foci, foci of this particular section is, is poking some fun at the foibles of idolatry and the ineffectiveness of the gods of the neighboring nations. That's a theme you'll see coming up over and over again in the Old Testament. It's a theme you see in our world too. What are the things that people worship today? And how effective are those things at helping them in their lives now and in their lives to come? God's presence is something to be cherished, not something to be feared. But it is something to be feared if you play around with it and disregard the importance of God and his presence in your world.